Kailas have rewritten the narrative of what is possible with passion and perseverance. With their achievements, they don't just inspire, but also pave the way for future generations of female athletes worldwide. Hello and welcome to Techno Phantom. We Flip 5G presents Women Pioneers of India in association with Republic TV. On the show with us today is one of India's most prolific cricketer, Arjuna Awadi, Major Dhyan Chand Khel Ratna recipient, Padma Shri, the highest run scorer in women's ODIs and the former captain of the Indian women's cricket team. Let's take a look at Mitali Raj's journey. Meet Mitali Raj, the cricket sensation whose journey has redefined the game. From making her international debut at 16 to becoming the highest run scorer in women's ODIs. Mitali's story is one of grit and determination. A trailblazer for Indian women's cricket, she led the team with elegance, breaking barriers and shattering records. With over two decades in cricket, Mitali's legacy extends beyond the pitch, inspiring a generation to dream big. and welcome to Techno Phantom. We Flip 5G presents Women Pioneers of India in association with Republic TV. Before we deep dive into this conversation, we'll start with a rapid fire round. Are you ready? Yeah, I am. Perfect. Okay. If you could share the field with any cricket legend, past or present, who would it be? I've not really shared the field with Shantaranga Swami. So she's someone I would love to uh, play, yeah. What's your favourite cricket stadium to play in and why? Lords would be my favourite because of the history and cricket being played for so many years. Mm. So yes, Lords it is. If you could time travel to witness any iconic cricket match, which one would it be? I would say the 1983 World Cup Finals. Yeah. Who is the funniest teammate in the dressing room and what's their signature prank? Someone who I've really gelled well is Amita Sharma because we are of the same age. Hmm. Her humour is, is very different. Like, you know, like a general stuff, she just starts to talk and suddenly you don't know when she's just pulled a prank on you. <laughs> so, uh, I've really had very good times with her, yeah. Nice. If you were not a cricketer, which sport do you think you would excel in? I would say I would be keen to get into basketball, though my height is, <laughs> is not that tall. But that is some you sport. You would have become taller if you played it. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that, that's the sport, yeah. Most challenging bowler you faced in your career and how did you tackle them? The one bowler that I found very difficult in the initial stages of my career was Lucy Pearson from England. Hmm. And she had the height of about, she was taller than Julian, like about six, six feet. And she would come and she would bowl with this very high arm action. It seemed like somebody's bowling from the first floor. Mm. I was finding very difficult to read her. Luckily for me, like within three or four years, she retired. So I didn't have to face her much <laughs> during my career. So Mitali, I must say that you played that very well. Not that I have a hamper to gift you. But uh, uh, it may not have been as rapid, but the answers were very interesting. So let's talk about you in detail, Mitali. Who is the inner Mitali and how did it all start for you? Because uh, your inclination was quite towards academics yeah. and uh, dancing would have probably come more naturally to you than cricket happened for very di different reasons is what I've read. Uh, how did it start? As you said, dance was something I started much cricket happened to me. And um, I was definitely someone who was uh, pretty strong even when I was a kid. That's what my mother would tell me. Like, you know, she never really had to worry too much about me as a kid because I would take care of myself and I would be at home. But there was one quality that my father really hated in me was that I was pretty lazy as a child to get up early in the morning. I would be the last person to wake up at home only to uh, inculcate the habit of early rising. My father decided that he takes me along with my brother because my brother was learning cricket when he was mm -hmm. in school. My first intro to the, to the sport was like this, like into an academy which was only boys is what I saw. It was an exclusive boys camp, not a single girl. And, um, and as, a, as a second sibling, like, you know, when you have an older sister, older brother, you want to ape them. Whatever mm -hmm. they do, you want to mm -hmm. do that as well. So I wanted to play because my brother was playing. Mm -hmm. And I told my father, I said, I want to learn the sport. So he said, this is not for girls. This is only for boys. Mm -hmm. And I took it uh, at, at that and I thought that, okay, it, it might be only for the boys. But few random 
uh, balls would come along where me and my father would sit under a tree and I would throw back to the boys. My brother's coach, he would see this, like, you know, this young girl coming every day sharp at six o'clock. So mm. let me at least feed her a few balls and see how good she is. So how far did you have to fight this ideology of cricket is a sport for boys and not for girls and when you actually excelled the way you did, what are the kind of gender stereotypes that you had to face? Most of us who've, who've played in the 80s, in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, I think it, it, we developed a thick skin because for us it was more of passion. There was absolutely no money in, in the sport mm. and it was pretty overshadowed by men's cricket for a long time. And it lived in obscurity, hmm. you know, despite like, say, for example, I broke the world record in 2002. And yet, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a big thing. For me, it started from my own, own home, actually, to say that my own uh, grandparents were not very keen that uh, I get into sports because um, a, a true South Indian family and a Tamilian family. There are many times when we used to travel by train, uh, seeing these huge kit bags, people would assume that it's a hockey team. Mm. And nobody would even consider that it could be, you know, for a second, it could be the girls playing cricket. So we had to tell them that, you know, we are uh, stateside cricketers or we play for India. And then they would come up with a lot of ignorant questions as to, oh, we do have a women's team, we do have girls playing, so what are the rules? It might be different because, you know, you really don't have the strength to clear boundaries or to play a test match, like a five-day test match or a four-day test match, you probably don't have the endurance. So yes, we, uh, we would, uh, with a lot of patience, answer all of that. But somewhere within, we did feel that hurt that, you know, it's still not recognized, despite the fact that the girls spend equal amount of time on the field. If not the support of the parents, you can't step out of the house mm. for a long time. Where are you going? Uh, what are you doing? Why are you wearing shorts and playing in front of the boys? And at that age, to listen to all this, to go through all this, were there days where you just felt like giving up or changing your profession? Or was there a sense of vengeance that, no, I'm going to flip this narrative one day? I had a very strong support system in, in, in place. That's my parents, my coach. Second is, I felt the only way that you could uh, change things is through your performance, through the opportunity. Sometimes, very rarely you get an opportunity, but make use of it. Hmm. Like say the ICC tournaments, usually they are the big tournaments that every country person would want to see what the national side is doing. So when we came under BCCI and then we started to be under ICC, recognized by ICC, so the World Cups became a very important platform. Mm. So one such thing was in 2013 ODI World Cup we had in India. So I felt that was the right opportunity for, for Indian women's team to do well so that in front of your home crowd you can put up the best standard, encourage or inspire young girls and probably change the perception of society and the parents so that they can allow the young girl who have interest in cricket to take up. So that's what I felt and I made sure that every time I walk on the field, whether people are watching me, whether the matches are live or not, whether people turn up to the stadium or not, I wanted to make sure I have a performance so that, you know, at some point, at some point people will start to sit up and notice. So, what were you like when you were growing up? Have you been more of an introvert? Was it a dream somewhere to want to be famous one day? Well, as a kid, um, to be very honest, I'm, I'm I've never been very ambitious. I've been a very free-flowing person. Mm. Uh, I've been an extrovert, in fact. I would talk to anybody and everybody as a kid. But when I got into cricket, and uh, because I started to represent under 15 when I was a nine-year-old kid, and I started to tour, leaving my parents around, uh, go with the team as a nine, ten-year-old, traveling in unreserved, sometimes overnight trains, so uh, I really enjoyed that sort of a freedom, you know, away from home, away from parents' eyes, uh, just your teammates, your seniors. Hmm. So I really didn't have um, my age group players to say like, you know, they would be my friends. For a nine-year-old, maybe a 10-year-old is a friend hmm. or 11-year-old. But you can't have a 16-year-old, you can't have a gap of like seven, eight years of your seniors hmm. in the side as your friends. Hmm. So I, then I started to be more of this observant kid or even when I made my debut for the state in 1995 senior level, I was a 13 year old and I was playing with my teammates would all be about 25, 26 year old. When I made debut for India, I was 16 year old and my teammates were like 
Purnima Rao, who was like literally my senior. She was about 28, 29. So my maturity level in terms of my mental setup was still not there for me to make friends with them. There was mm. always that age gap. So wherever I played, I was always the youngest or probably the baby of the team. And I was always the pampered one, even uh, in the team. But when I have my own people around, the comfort level is there, like Amit and who I've played with, then I'm a very different person. I'm, I'm pretty much like them. Hmm. Nurturing the dream of playing for India is something my coach has put the, sowed the seed in me and my father. The sport has taught me a lot. Hmm. Just not the sport because I started leading India at a very young age. And when I retired, I retired as a captain. So I've um, captained about four generations, I would say. Mm -hmm. From seniors, ex-captains, to players of my age, to juniors, and to the ones who, who were born after I, was, I made my debut. Mm -hmm. So you can understand the, the, the generation of right. players that I've led. And uh, as a leader, I think even that has taught me a lot of lessons. Um, it humbled me uh, when you're young, uh, there's a rush of blood and you want to change the world, you want to change the setup and all of that. Uh, but I had a very good bunch of senior players to sort of navigate me through those initial phases of my career as a captain. As I said, 2005 was my first big tournament that I got into as a full-time captain. Hmm. And uh, I, I had, uh, it was pretty much a senior heavy side. And for me at that time, I didn't know how to go about it. It was a World Cup. And I had my own self-doubt whether I would be a good captain leading the team into the World Cup. And we came runners-up. And my involvement in that World Cup or contribution was more of a batter than the leader that I was. Because I was a rookie in experience and mm. I had the ex-captains like Anju, Anjum, all of them trying to help me and guide me on the ground. So when I was a young leader, it was like, follow me, it's the highway or my way sort of a thing, <laughs> you know, I'm right, this is what we have to do and all of that. Right. But then with, um, over a period of time, I came to understand that uh, that is not the right way to lead, you know. Mm. Uh, I've developed compassion for my teammates. Sometimes you don't understand from where they come or uh, some, some of the players are enduring maybe family issues, their personal issues, you know, and that probably is affecting their performance. Every time I'm learning new stuff, how to deal with a person, because it's just not about leading a team onto the field, but it's also man management. Right. You need to know how Greatly. to deal with each and every player, yes. the, their vulnerabilities, the insecurities. It's, it's the part of the job of the captain. It's just not about enjoying the highs of the team, but when the team is low, how do you back each and every player? And sometimes you identify potential. How do you give them opportunities? And there are some, how, they, how do you give them the space that they grow in their own time? You don't push them to grow faster. I guess every generation of players that I led had their own challenges. Uh, but the most difficult one was the current generation <laughs> because of the, of the age, age gap. And it, it was the reversal, I would say, like when I probably when I started playing as a 16 year old and I had senior players who were like about, you know, the early 30s and suddenly I found myself in a similar situation in the last World Cup where, you know, say Richa Ghosh and uh, Shafali Verma who, who were not even born when I made my debut for India. Mm -hmm. And growing up, all those girls have probably seen me play, yes. idolized me That's and they, they got inspired by me and suddenly when you find your role model in the dressing room and you wouldn't know how to react, how to go about it. <laughs> I would be a little uncomfortable, they would be in that zone. It was a little weird initially. Um, I had to find my way how I could sort of break the ice with that, that players, that bunch of players. For example, I had a partnership with Richa Ghosh and uh, I was able to help her uh, bat along with me in the middle. And that's how I started to talk and she got comfortable. You know, people cannot really understand how difficult it is. Right. And um, being a leader, being a captain uh, for such a long time, uh, definitely I've been in some of the loneliest places I could be. My journey as a cricketer and as a captain has also gone through this evolution of the sport, like pre-BCCI and post-BCCI. When we came under the umbrella of BCCI in 2007, a lot of things which we struggled as a players, as team, uh, finding uh, sponsors, getting uh, tournaments organized or international series at, at a regular interval, uh, getting your domestic uh, in a structured manner, 
looking after stay, travel, all of this has been taken care of BCCI and there was match fees even though it may not be in comparison to men's cricket at that point of time. I think it was a start. I would say earlier it was about 25 max that the girls would say and then uh, maybe there was you get into the family where you get married or you get into finding another job because clearly playing cricket you wouldn't earn money so it was not a professional sport I have I've broken the world record at 214 runs I don't have a video recording of it uh, it's only that whoever has been part of the team knows how I've played or what what the camaraderie has been at that point of time how the team has gone through that test match so there were many matches like that that we can only talk about but we don't have a video about it or to look back and see oh this is how we played so coming under BCCI and the first World Cup was in 2009, like we were having the BCCI logo and then it was conducted by ICC. Then the first time Star Sports came into picture to so, sort of uh, cover few games hmm. of that World Cup. And I could see what difference it could make for a player, for a person who's watching women's cricket and uh, the growth of the sport. For the first time I've seen myself on television batting, you have the greats of the game like Wasi Makram and all of that, all of them, uh, you know, commentating, appreciating your stroke make, which you get to see only in men's cricket mm -hmm. until then. And then my father saw me for the first time live on television, your uh, cousins, all of them who know you, who've seen me play all these years, only, you know, in some grounds or school grounds, have actually watching me live on television it's it's a big thing so they had this big hoardings at the stadium whoever turns up for the men's game would see this hoarding saying okay this is the next big event the women's world cup mm -hmm. and all the captains pictures were there on the hoarding and so i had a friend call me up and say look i can see your picture on the hoarding in <laughs> uh, in england i was like this is not this is not bad this is a good way of publicizing it and then the way the team did in the 2017 world cup i think that really sort of changed the entire setup of how people's um, view towards women's cricketers. I think that's that's a huge turning point. And of course, in the recent times, uh, credit to BCCI for getting pay equity. The girls, uh, you know, the match fees is similar, is is on par with the men's. In fact, they have the same match fees. So mm. it was a it was a long journey to see women's cricket where it is today. This year, we had the first season of women's Premier League and uh, seeing uh, you know the girls earn money and even the domestic players who probably wouldn't have even imagined of playing one two two months of good cricket and they can earn some amount so i think things really are changing and i'm sure it will only go bigger and bigger absolutely and we all hope for that in fact one can only imagine listening to you to all the hardships that you may have gone through and it was high time that these changes came about but uh, needless to say there is a reason that you are an inspiration to millions of girls because of all that you've done Vitali we have to slip into a very short commercial break right yeah. now but we'll continue with this conversation on the other side and for all of you watching us do stay tuned to Techno Phantom we flip 5G presents women pioneers of India in association with Republic TV We'll continue this conversation with Mitali on the other side. Diana Edulji, a cricket pioneer from the past, embodies the true essence of flipping the narrative. As one of India's first female cricketers, her remarkable contributions set the stage for the evolution of women's cricket, leaving an enduring legacy. Edulji's unwavering passion and skill continue to inspire generations, cementing her as a true icon in the history of Indian cricket. Welcome back to Techno Phantom. We Flip 5G presents Women Pioneers of India in association with Republic TV. We are in conversation with Mitali Raj. Mitali, needless to say that when it comes to women's cricket, your name is synonymous with that. But now we really want to know more about you. Are you the sort of a person where pressure works well with you or you completely calm yourself down? How do you face those challenges? Thinking about pressure or thinking about expectation really doesn't work for me. 
whatever skill that you have to prepare, that is already done in your preparatory camp. You can't mm. really add anything else new before a tournament, and which is obviously not advisable also. Mm. But what I tend to do a lot more is work on my mental preparation. Because if you're in a very good mental state, I think that really helps to um, understand the situation on the ground and play according to it. And if not cricket, would you have been a dancer? I clearly would be um, a dancer for sure because mm -hmm. I was just two, maybe two stages away from giving my ringratum in uh, Bharatnatyam. So I would have pursued dance. I might probably ha would have uh, pursued uh, IAS maybe. I'm also into a bit of sketching, but I don't do that very often because clearly when you're really stressed, you really can't sketch much. But when I'm at home and I have a little long breaks, um, I do sketching, but I'm a voracious reader. I, I read a lot. Yeah. So, Mitali, tell us about some crazy fan interactions if you've had. Well, I'm sure uh, for many it would be there, but uh, one such thing was, uh, this is not again in the digital era, but um, those, uh, I used to get uh, crystals for my birthday every year. This was early 2000 and uh -huh. I just moved into my new house and uh, for every birthday this guy would be sending me crystals. Sometimes it's dolphins, sometimes there was a Taj Mahal uh -huh. and all of that. So, um, and suddenly it stopped coming. Uh -huh. So one day my mother like, you know, this birthday, you didn't get anything from that guy. I said, I don't know who that guy is, but he's been sending. You might have found a girlfriend or you might have found someone else <laughs> to send it to. So this was one of those things that we didn't know, but ev promptly every birthday he would send me. Yeah. <laughs> How far do you think that technology can empower women to challenge and shatter traditional gender norms and empower women to take control of their lives? It definitely does play a huge role. Like say for example, uh, for us at least like you know from an era where there was no video analyst, where the matches were not televised and now when the matches are televised we have a, a video analyst travelling with uh, every team, even the state side have them. So they get recording and the players can watch their own um, performance, uh, pick what they want to improve on, what has worked for them, strategize. Similarly bowler knows what the batter is doing and the batter knows what sort of uh, strategy the bowler is employing. Now you know if you want to express something or something you've done really well and it can be amplified within minutes. Mitali as we come to the end of this show, what is your message to the millions of girls watching you right now? Well I would say uh, dream big, uh, be ambitious, there's nothing wrong in being ambitious but pursue your dreams and your ambitions with a lot of ferocity, a lot of um, uh, courage, passion. Um, be up for challenges because that's how one will evolve and grow. Anything that you achieve very early in life may not be sustainable, but mm. if you want something to be sustained for a long time, quality is something which sustains for a long time. Wanting to achieve it overnight or within a few months or few years, which people have taken years to achieve, I think that's where most of the time we go wrong because quality comes with a lot of hard work. And shortcuts don't work. Yeah, it, it never did and it will never will. <laughs> On that note, let's take a selfie. Sure. <laughs>